Good morning and welcome to this UK India Business Council webinar on Brand India. How a change in government is boosting the nation's brand worldwide, making it the most attractive brick country. My name is Aina Gupta, Research and Communications Executive at UK India Business Council and I will be moderating this session. In a nutshell, Brand India refers to the umbrella campaign spearheaded by the Modi government to project the attractiveness of India as an emerging destination for business across the entire spectrum of manufacturing, information technology, infrastructure, and the service sectors. Flagship programs such as Make in India and Digital India have significantly contributed to boosting India's impression on the global stage. In this webinar, we will discuss the power of the right branding and publicity, as well as soft power, in building India's image as a global leader and a force to reckon with. Before we begin, I would like to familiarize you with the toolbox on the right hand side of your screens. Just to let you know, we will have everyone on mute during the course of the webinar to keep any background noise to a minimum. But if you have a question, please drop it into the little bracket on the toolbox to your right in the please type your question here section to send me your question and I will take it up during our Q&A session at the end. For now, to make sure you can all hear me clearly, could I please ask that you all use the raise your hand button on the toolbar? Could you please click the raise your hand button? Okay, thank you. I'm delighted to welcome Ambassador Kishan S. Rana, who is currently Professor Emeritus of the Diplo Foundation, a nonprofit organization based in Malta with offices in Geneva and Belcre. During his illustrious career, he has authored several books on topics such as diplomacy, foreign relations, and corporate culture, to name a few. As ambassador to Algeria, Czechoslovakia, Kenya, Mauritius, and Germany, he has acquired considerable expertise in promoting Brand India. We are honored to have him here with us today to share his thoughts on what more needs to be done to build Brand India and keep the world excited and enthused about the India opportunity. I would now like to welcome Ambassador Rana for his insights on Brand India. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me now? Am I clear? Hello. Is yes, sir. Microphone? You are clear and you are uh, good to go. Hello. Wonderful. Yeah, it is Great. clear. You can, you can start. Yeah. I'll start. Thank you. I want to begin by saying that um, in a way <clears throat> we have a paradox. The paradox is that on the one side uh, India seems to be doing very well in projecting uh, its brand image. Uh, soft power as well, but I will put the soft power issue aside for the moment and uh, focus only on the brand dimension. So while we are doing well, as uh, the organizers of this webinar have pointed out, there is also a situation that there is really no official branding policy. There is no public diplomacy board in India, unlike say the UK or France or many other countries. And the entire broad subject of public diplomacy does not figure on the um, teaching curriculum of any institution in India. So you have a certain number of people who began to talk about branding, about the country brand, how corporate ideas can be applied to the way in which a country presents itself to its own people and to the world at large. Uh, and of course, we also have in India a great deal of interest in soft power. But public diplomacy as such is, a, is an understudied subject. Be that as it may, uh, let's first look at what's happened uh, in terms of projecting brand India. Uh, first slide, please. 
<coughs> Prime Minister Modi's first year has seen an extraordinary emphasis on foreign affairs to an extent we have never seen before in India. His 18 journeys abroad, the number of visitors he has received, and the quality of his personal engagement in promoting bilateral relationships with countries has been extraordinary. Uh, he has, for the first time in India's history, embarked on a neighbor's first policy, and he's delivered on that. He has made journeys to Bhutan, then Nepal, then Sri Lanka, and now most recently, Bangladesh. Pakistan is a country with whom relations are remain tense, remain fraught, but at the same time, an effort has been made to reach out, uh, the clearest evidence of which was the fact that uh, Pakistan, the Pakistan Prime Minister was invited to and attended the inauguration of the new Prime Minister, which again was a new practice that he initiated. Uh, FDI inflows in India are doing well, uh, the Economist in a rather, rather naughty uh, front cover cartoon showed Prime Minister Narendra Modi as a one-man band and just in case anybody missed the message, he even had the, uh, uh, the kitchen sink hanging from his coattails to show that he was really in charge of everything, including the kitchen sink. Uh, let's then look at the pluses and the minuses, a kind of balance sheet of India's uh, current branding. Uh, slide two, please. On the plus side, uh, the tourism campaign, which has been on now for almost 10 years, Incredible India, has been very successful. Um, not only has the number of tourists risen uh, continually, it's not received spectacular numbers compared with, say, Malaysia or Thailand or even Sri Lanka, uh, to say nothing of China. But the tourist spend in India is rather high. The average foreign tourist, um, I think, spends the second highest amount uh, compared with any other country. I think the highest tourist spend uh, happens in Australia. The external image shines well. I have taken the liberty of saying maybe it is almost ahead of reality. Uh, that's debatable. Somebody may disagree with me. But the fact is that the Indian economy is doing well. There is a serious effort to uh, show the manner in which the facilitation of business uh, is uh, moving forward. And the Modi government is determined that India should greatly improve its uh, position on the global index of ease of doing business. You would recall in the last last year its position was at a miserable 142 and this government has set itself the task of taking it among the first 50 countries. Let's see how that works out. But business finds the Modi government credible and that's the most important thing. And of course India has benefited from low oil prices Maybe a little slowdown in China has helped us. And the diaspora is very, very enthusiastic about the government. The minuses. As I said earlier, there is no brand driver as such, apart from the Prime Minister himself, and there is no brand board. The reform agenda has been moving forward, but not entirely as well as many would wish. Many people are now asking, walk the talk. The rating agencies, Moody's, uh, Standard & Poor and the others are cautious. Uh, most have improved India's um, credit rating by one notch, but it's only one small notch. The External Affairs Ministry, where I spent 35 years in my working career, it's pushing it, the action envelope and it's working to improve in this inter-ministry actions. Uh, slide three, please. So let me then go on to 
what I think are the broad conclusions that I have to offer. And that is, uh, as a Chief Minister, Narendra Modi pushed officials in Gujarat to improve their performance. He's doing the same in Delhi. Uh, in a sense, officials feel empowered. So that's on the plus side. His handling of parliament and his coalition partners has thrown up difficulties. You may know that the upper house in India, the Rajya Sabha, uh, is, consists of members elected by state assemblies. This means that when there is a change of government at the center, the complexion of the upper house reflects that change only after two years and in some ways after four years because every member of the upper house is elected to a six-year term and one-third of them retire every two years. So there is a time lag. You may imagine that the constitution framers of India, the, our, our um, founding fathers, uh, wanted a kind of built-in check against uh, uh, a government that was popular today but uh, may have perhaps uh, tendencies of uh, abusing power. So uh, the Modi government has problems with its legislation agenda. On the other side, the Modi government is doing an outstanding job in working with states. This is something that he has put forward, again, as a novel agenda for India, the notion of cooperative federalism, and that seems to be gaining traction. So we expect that economic growth will continue to power forward. But the government has a real challenge in, um, in steering, in managing the reform agenda. So Modi seems to suggest that the India brand really depends on what he delivers not smoke and mirrors or glib marketing. And I have a postscript that I've added at the end of my uh, short presentation, and I will quickly go through this as well. As I said right at the beginning, the country brand as a subject is not widely discussed in India. Rather few of the global gurus of marketing have visited India. Soft power is frequently mentioned but it's not really studied in depth. I mean, everyone says that Bollywood is India's soft power. And that is right. I, just to give you an example, an Indian film that was released last month called PK has surprisingly, has done surprisingly well in China, uh, notching up uh, much greater revenues than anybody had anticipated. Uh, so you have attributes of soft power that do well, but compared with, say, China's uh, TV network, on which that country is believed to spend uh, somewhere in the region of $8 billion, uh, Doordarshan, the official Indian TV network, uh, has a very small footprint abroad. But then in compensation, the private Indian TV channels seem to do quite well. And they, on a purely commercial basis, uh, can now be found in almost every country around the globe, usually as an option that Indians and sometimes other people pick up because they like to see Indian TV serials, for example. So in a sense, Prime Minister Modi has given, has converted Make in India into a brand slogan. And this is for the first time that India has a global economic marketing slogan. It's almost become a rallying cry because you would know that the share of manufacturing in Indian GDP is currently very, very low, barely 16%. Uh, no country can move forward, can become a serious economic player without a solid domestic manufacturing base. And at the heart of it, this is what Prime Minister Modi is trying to do. 
Thank you very much. I hope I have not uh, tried your patience with my remarks. I would be happy to respond to any questions that are put to me uh, and respond as best as I can. Thank you very much again. Many thanks for that excellent overview, Ambassador Rana. The slide with the balance sheet is particularly informative and useful. I will now open the floor to some questions. The first question is, what according to you is Modi's stance on UK-India relations and the special partnership between our two countries? Um, as you know, Prime Minister Modi has not yet visited the UK. And some people have criticized that. But in fact, when he went to Europe, uh, I think it was in April, UK was right in the middle of its elections. So he traveled to France, to Germany, and to Canada. I'm sure UK is going to be a top priority as his next destination in the coming months. Uh, I'm a little wary of calling any country a special partner. Uh, this, a country like India has to be open to all. It has to offer facilities for foreign direct investment, for, for trade, for, for, for innovation, for technology, and for all manner of economic partners, partnerships with all countries around the world. You may recall that it was in the early 90s that um, when India's economic reform started, that India and UK actually carried out an, a, a special program. I think it was called the UK-India um, uh, Business Forum, if, I'm, if I remember the right uh, name for it. That was instrumental in raising the level of our bilateral trade, flow of investments and everything else. For example, when Modi traveled to Japan, there was a notion that investment from Japan should have a special track. When he was in Korea, in South Korea, people said South Korean investors should be given a special track. I've said in writing that what matters is to give a special track to all investors. All foreign investors should be treated with much greater um, welcome and facilitated as actively as we can facilitate them. So, getting back, I'm all in favor of a stronger partnership with the UK, but it will be a partnership that takes place partly in competition with other partnerships, and it will work, move forward on its own rights. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The next question is on the government's key campaign, Make in India. It's all very well to say Make in India, but in practice this seems to apply only to certain sectors, for example infrastructure and defense, whereas other sectors such as retail continue to have the same restrictions as before. This is one of the main reasons that this campaign hasn't been as effective as Modi envisioned it to be. What, according to you, can be done to resolve this situation? And related to this, we have another question. If manufacturing is currently only 16% of GDP, what specific actions are in place to improve? Well, um, the second question is easier, so I'll tackle it first, if I may. I think a whole manner of activities are on. Uh, see, one of the reasons why share of manufacture fell was because domestic policy, um, the tax policy, the customs duty structure seemed to be weighed in favor of import of components which were manufactured abroad. That's changed now. Now there is a clear emphasis that a preference will be given and it will be economically advantageous for companies, Indian and foreign to make in India because it will lower their costs. So I think that is moving forward. And we see lots and lots of little uh, 
episodic bits of information, it doesn't yet total up to new set of numbers. I can't tell you that uh, the share of manufacturer has jumped up from 16 to 18 percent or anything else, but I think that is very much in the pipeline. The first question raised a very important point. Why does India not permit easy inflow of foreign investment in certain sectors, specifically retail? Well, the reasons are a little complicated. The retail industry in India is dominated by small shops, by small shopkeepers who run uh, little establishments that provide services. And there was an apprehension that if big retailers came in, they would sink, that they would be drowned out, they would be elbowed out. Um, we've seen now in India in the last couple of years that with the growth of e-retailing in India, that while e-retailing, which is domestic essentially, has grown very well, it's uh, minting money actually, they have not been able to replace the small shopkeeper. The small shopkeeper is also doing well. In fact, he is adapted and some small shopkeepers are beginning to shift to uh, internet-based platforms in their business. So, I see that there will be a push by this government to open up the retail sector, but it will happen maybe after the year or a little longer than that because it is a political issue and in every country there are always domestic political sensitivities, domestic constituencies who have to be appeased in the process of moving the entire economy forward. Uh, if we had a perfect state in the world, an economy that was run by economists and nobody else mattered, uh, maybe we might have a perfect uh, environment for economic activity. But I personally doubt it. Uh, democracies are messy. Democracies involve compromise. But eventually they find the right solution even if it takes a little bit longer. So I would say, yes, you are right. There are some sectors in which India is not as welcoming of foreign investments as it ought to be. I hope very much that that picture changes quite soon. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Rana. The bureaucratic process of India has an impact on brand India, and related to this, there are two questions. We are aware that the government wants to improve ease of doing business, and is there any quick fix solution to simplify the bureaucratic process and improve India's brand on ease of doing business? Also. What advice can be given to UK companies considering entry into the Indian business arena and how to deal with the government of India and the bureaucratic processes? Okay. Um, let's, let's first take the question of whether there is a quick fix to uh, removing bureaucratic hurdles. You know, in life, uh, in the real world, there are very seldom quick fixes. But what is happening is that this government has encouraged states to compete with one another in terms of the facilities they provide. Let's now get to specifics. One of the biggest hurdles for any foreign investor in India is acquisition of land. You have some states that make it quite easy for a foreign investor to obtain land. Gujarat is one of those states. Rajasthan is in the process of getting to become one of those states. So naturally, there will be a tendency for a foreign investor to go to such states. Tamil Nadu is yet another state where this is happening. Along with that, the Modi government has started a process. Again, for the first time in India, it is going to produce a domestic index of ease of doing business comparing different states. This has never been tried before. So in a sense, he wants states to understand that 
the easier they make it for foreign investors and domestic investors who are equally important, the more investments will flow to them. So the object is in a matter of a few months to publish a national index of comparing the facilities offered by different states. Woody says quite openly that his, um, his notion of cooperative federalism is also, he has modified that term to add the word competitive. So he now says he is pushing for cooperative and competitive federalism, where states compete with one another to attract investments, domestic as well as foreign. I think this will produce results. Take a, a different typical blockage in foreign investments, and that was environmental clearances. We had a situation where the Ministry of Environment would hold up approval. They wouldn't say yes and they wouldn't say no, which meant that the investor got extremely frustrated. That process has now been speeded up and the Environment Ministry is much more on the ball in coming out with investment approvals. Uh, other than that, uh, the entire bureaucratic machine is being streamlined, being pushed. I'll give you an example. This example comes to me from a private information source which I cannot disclose. But this major foreign company received a visit for the first time ever by a very senior Indian official who said in X sector the India's major competitors are countries A and B. He said what is it that countries A and B do which we need to do in order to make India as welcoming of investments in that particular sector as countries A and B. Now this company was delighted to be asked for the first time to uh, shall we say provide a kind of comparative uh, scenario to the Indian authorities and say you need to fix A, B, C, D, C uh, activities and then investments will become easier. I mention this example to show the kind of mindset with which this government is functioning. It is genuinely reaching out to investors, it is genuinely trying to solve the problems faced by investors. Um, you know, the World Bank carried out a study on foreign investments and how countries can invite or make themselves more welcoming of foreign investments. And it mentioned that there are two methodologies for investment promotion. One is the broad approach, we take all the short term approach, and the other is the rifle short approach, where you target an investor and go to the investor and say, how do I bring you to my country? What is it that you require in order to come and set up production facilities in my country? I think this government is now trying out for the first time a rifle shot approach. These are the methods that have been used so successfully by countries like Singapore, by Israel, by Ireland and by many others. So I do believe that uh, behind the words, behind the slogans, the reality of investment facilitation is very much under improvement. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Rana. We are running out of time, so I'll end the question and answer session now. Thank you for your insights. They were really very interesting. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope this webinar was valuable to you. If you have any feedback or comments about today's session, or a session that you'd want to see us do in the future, please feel free to get in touch. I would also like to invite you to visit our website and check for the webinars that we are organizing as part of our Access India series, a program designed to support UK businesses through short online sessions on a variety of topics. Our previous Access India webinars are also available to watch at any time.
You may also wish to look for the Access India hashtag on Twitter to join the discussions. Thank you for joining us.